Yeah, welcome back to Count It right here on Points Bet USA. It's your boy Kazim Famiwide. Happy Tuesday, y'all. Happy play in night. The playoffs, I guess, start tonight. Now, are we are we counting the play in as part of the playoffs, right? Like this is postseason basketball. Uh, but I can't wait for it to pop off tonight. The Miami Heat and the Atlanta Hawks at eight. Timberwolves and Lakers on the nightcap. We're gonna get into all of that. But before we do, you got to get into some of these incredible headlines coming in to postseason basketball, right? Like, a lot of times teams are getting ready to end their season, and there's lots of optimism in the air. There's the chance that you can make this season be one for the ages by going far in the playoffs or even winning an NBA championship. But there's also a handful of other teams that have gone through A whole lot of drama and are very, very upset. At the front and center of this is the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now, yesterday, uh, we talked all about the incredible altercation between slow-mo Kyle Anderson and Rudy Gobert that erupted in fisticuffs on the bench, something you never see, especially between two teammates. And uh, Jada McDaniels pulling in Amari Stoudemire and breaking his hand uh, on the way out of the arena, but Rudy Gobert, the main centerpiece in a blockbuster trade that took place almost a year ago to put the Timberwolves in position to make this sort of postseason run is suspended for that very situation, the play-in game because of the altercation with Kyle Anderson. Now, I've been reading a lot about just what's been going on with the Minnesota Timberwolves because if you've listened to the show or watched me talk about this a lot, you see how big of a fan I am of the Minnesota Timberwolves, specifically because of Anthony Edwards and the star power he has and the ability that I think he can he can have to carry a team to the next level. But earlier in the season, I was extremely miffed that the Timberwolves made this trade for Rudy Gobert for many reasons. One, not necessarily a style fit. Doesn't give Anthony Edwards the best opportunity to really explore himself as a scorer and give him space to operate. You already got Carl Anthony Towns, another seven-footer. Doesn't really want to bang down there. He's much more of a finesse stretch five type of guy. So you're going very old school with two seven-footers and a shooting guard that needs to slash and needs to get to the basket in a year I mean in a in an era of NBA basketball when there's absolutely spacing is absolutely key and being able to penetrate and dish and kick out the shooters is how every offense damn near works the Minnesota Timberwolves were already like uh, uh working from behind when they got Rudy Gobert so that being said you gotta look at this trade from the the moment it happened with the Utah Jazz to now as one of the most lopsided, disgusting, generational fleeces I've ever seen in my life. And now, after all of that, (laughs) you're not even going to play in the game that you swing and make a big trade for a blockbuster player for. Let's look back at what Rudy Gobert was traded for and look at some of the players Uh, and what they did this year and are doing this year. The Minnesota Timberwolves received the Rudy Gobert, and in return, the Jazz received Malik Beasley, integral part of the Los Angeles Lakers team that they will be playing tonight. Patrick Beverly in Chicago right now, getting ready for a play-in tournament game against the Toronto Raptors. Leandro Balmero. uh, Walker Kessler, a guy who was... And not only played just as good as Rudy Gobert, but arguably better as far as being a defensive center and what he brings to a basketball team. Jared Vanderbilt, another player that's going to be integral to this Los Angeles Lakers team that they are playing tonight. In addition to that, they got four first-round picks and a 2026 first-round pick swap. I look at that trade. And I just go like this to Danny Ainge. (laughs) Talk about a fleecing 
of a team, right? The Utah Jazz didn't make the play-in tournament, but that doesn't necessarily really matter. They won the minute this trade went through. Because not only are the Timberwolves now in a position to have to win and have to be better, setting Rudy Gobert home and putting him in a position where, I mean, let's face it, everybody around the league, players that talk, players with podcasts, he's been an easy punching bag for several seasons. And to be honest, he hasn't made it that that hard to be a punching bag for him, right? Like, it, he's been a guy who hasn't been a defensive presence that he used to be. He was once looked at as one of the best defensive players in the entire league, and now he's a defensive liability. On top of that, he's not a scorer. He has no moves around the basket. Only thing he can really do is finish around the rim. And funny enough, without Rudy Gobert, I like the Minnesota Timberwolves' chances more against the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, having no uh, uh, Jaden McDaniels, that's something that might uh, be an issue because I think he's going to be the guy primarily responsible with guarding LeBron James. However, no Rudy Gobert might give the, the Minnesota Timberwolves a better puncher's chance against the Los Angeles Lakers. I like the way Carl Anthony Towns matches up with Anthony Davis when they're both healthy. Obviously, I still like Anthony Davis better. I mean, Anthony Edwards, a guy who was a first-time All-Star this year, who when no when it, when there's less than two seven-footers clogging up the paint, he has more opportunities to be a special player that he is. Mike Conley Jr., don't sleep on him. A point guard who is steady, probably the better point guard of the two when it goes against him and D'Angelo Russell uh, in this matchup. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a death knell for the Timberwolves without Rudy Gobert. Without Jaden McDaniels, eh, Maybe that's a little bit more difficult because he's probably your best perimeter defender. But it's sad that you make a trade for a guy like this and he's been so underwhelming this year that you like your chances better with him staying at home, not being a distraction, not causing people to curse him out in in huddles, and obviously not punching people because – I don't know. Somebody told you to get a rebound or something. I don't know. I thought that was your job, Rudy. But in any case, Timberwolves Lakers tonight. Can't wait to dive into that game later on this year. Speaking of disgruntled, speaking of exit interviews, speaking of players uh, starting to air their grievances, Damian Lillard, superstar point guard for the Portland Trail Blazers, uh, said, quote, I don't have an appetite for building with guys two and three years away. He wants to give himself a chance to compete right now. Dame, Dame, Dame. Last game of the season, they got absolutely blitzed by the Golden State Warriors, 157-101. Obviously, no Dame Lillard. Obviously, they got some young players that are excited. Shaden Sharp comes to mind. Um, But this is, he's in his 30s. And... For a guy who has done so much of his legacy building in the playoffs, it does kind of suck not seeing him get a chance to go for it because he's not getting any younger. And the more I look at Damian Lillard and the more that I look at his loyalty to a franchise and his perseverance to want to make it happen in the same place that he was drafted at, I look and I can't help but think of Kevin Garnett and thinking about the same sort of passion he had for a franchise, the same sort of vigor that he wanted to not just win, but win for a city that he's made a home for more than a decade. And unfortunately for KG, he never got to bring that championship to Minnesota. But fortunately for him, I think he gave so much of that franchise of himself that they did right by him and just, hey, man, we, we're, we're, we're not a year away. We're not even a piece away. For our own good, for us to win, I think the Blazers' probably best shot is to do right by Dame and know that you're two or three years away. And the best opportunity to get pieces to help continue that build is to trade away one of the greatest players in in NBA history, according to the top 75 all-time team. 
And it sucks, man. You know, everybody wants a fairy tale ending. Everybody wants to be a hero to a city that they're drafted to. And sometimes you just got to look in the mirror and say, hey, I've done everything I can possibly do here. I mean, do you take a swing if you're Portland and try and go after uh, Jalen Brown from Boston if they don't make it out of the of the of the playoffs and make it out to make it back to the finals? Do you take a swing at a Kyrie Irving who might be available at the end of the season? I don't know if he got the money to pull it off, but I don't know, man. They don't have a real great track record of signing star players and giving them those uh, that Robin to Dame Lillard's Batman. They've tried. C.J. McCollum was the closest they had to it, and he saw the success they had. But I don't know, man. I, I hope for basketball fans' sake everywhere, we get to see Damian Lillard back playing meaningful postseason basketball again because for a guy that great, nobody wants to see him watching ping pong balls bounce around in the month. Nobody wants to see that. But we'll see how it goes, man. I don't think he's going to be the one to, to request the trade. I don't think he's built like that. But I think the Portland franchise eventually has to assess all their chips and understand, like, hey, Dame's going to bring in lots of guys. He's going to be a franchise player. He's somebody we can sell tickets on, obviously. But for the greater good of the Portland Trailblazers, I don't know how much longer you can avoid not just setting Dame free, reshuffling the decks, and starting over. We'll see what happens with this offseason. And somebody who's in a very similar situation, uh, a star guard who committed to a city that he was drafted to, uh, signed for a whole lot of money, Bradley Beal said uh, he's having a low patience level with the Wizards. Uh, he's dead. He's definitely frustrated. And, um, you know, he had a question saying, you know, let's, let me make sure I get the quote correctly. He said, quote, I'm definitely frustrated, but I'm also at peace with where I am and who we are and what we need to do to be better. There's nothing I can do. I can't control it. And I'm not going to sit here and cuss everybody out. We know where we failed and we have to get and we and how we got to get better. We have to do so. He also joked around saying you're acting like you're trying to kick me out of here. And um, yeah, Bradley Beal, another guy who was on the radar of a lot of contending teams when it came to trading for a star scoring guard. The Lakers are one of them. A lot of other teams are out there. But another disappointing season for the Wizards. But the way, if you're listening to general manager Tom Shepard uh, of the Washington Wizards, it feels like they're going to try and run it back. I think they like the way Kyle Kuzma grew as a go-to scorer. Chris Haps Porzingis had a surprisingly healthy year, a bounce-back season, after uh, being with the Slovenian ball stopper in Dallas and his numbers taking a bit of a hit. Um, but Bradley Beal, I mean, health is one thing with him. But at the same time, he's another guy who's getting a little long in the tooth. He's not necessarily an old guy by any means. But is he a player built to win in the Eastern Conference as currently constituted? You look at the Boston Celtics. You look at the Milwaukee Bucks. You look at the rise of the New York Knicks. You look at the 76ers, who probably have the MVP. Those are four teams already. The Cleveland Cavaliers, star guards, have pieces, have a great future. I mean... It's going to be rough if you're a Washington Wizards fan and you want to see it work with that three of Porzingis, Beal, and uh, Kyle Kuzma. I don't think it's impossible. You know, we've seen one-season turnarounds happen like that, but they just need to find a mix that really works and try to take a little bit of the scoring load from the perimeter off of Bradley Beal. doesn't seem like they're going to be able to trade him. He signed a contract that makes him hard to trade, and – his production isn't necessarily at the level where you sell the farm and try and make a go at it with him at this point, right? Maybe a couple of years ago, you might have taken a swung and pair him with a LeBron James, a Anthony Davis, uh, a Paul George, a Kawhi Leonard, any of those guys. But I don't know any general manager or team owner that's going to say, hey, we're a Bradley Beal away from competing. So the Wizards are kind of in this tough space right now where they probably aren't going to get better unless their players get better and healthier. And they got a guy signed to a monster contract that is pretty hard to move. So I don't necessarily think Bradley Beal gets moved, 
But I do think this is a team that needs to absolutely hit on their draft picks and hit on a, a distributing, solid point guard. I don't know who it is out there that maybe makes that leap, but there's going to there's gonna be a pick of the litter this offseason, man, and I keep telling people, don't think there aren't going to be suitors for Kyrie Irving, man. Like, I know the Wizards probably don't have the money to make it happen, but trust me, there are players out there, there are teams out there that can use that offensive firepower to at least give them a little bit of a nudge. After 35 wins this season, the, the Wizards were kind of on the cusp of the play-in tournament. I think maybe with a little bit of health luck between Beal and Kuzma, maybe those things change. But in any case, the Wizards are where they are, a sort of middle-of-the-road team with middle-of-the-road stars in the middle of a run of a huge, huge contract from one of their franchise players. The season's over for those guys, but it's not for a couple of other teams that play tonight in the play-in tournament. The Lakers, the T-Wolves, the Hawks, and the Heat. The host of Chasing Paper, Joe Osborne, is going to join me right here on Count It After the Break. We're going to all to the, gonna get into all of the play-in tournament action, and we're going to take a look at some of his picks for some of the off-season, post-season awards. Don't go anywhere. We got more Count It coming up right after this. And welcome back to Counter right here on Points Bet USA. <laughs> Joining me today is the host of Chasing Paper, the one and only Joe Osborne. What's going on, Joe? What is up, my man? I'm excited for the NBA postseason to get going here uh, tonight. Uh, the last week of the NBA season was a bit rough with all the players sitting out and stuff, but the games actually matter now, so let's get right into it. Speaking of the end of the season being rough, uh, they probably could have been more rough to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Losing Jaden McDaniels, pulling on Amari Stoudemire, breaking his hand, punching a gl- uh, punching the wall. Obviously, the altercation between Kyle Anderson and Rudy Gobert. They take on the Lakers tonight. Rudy Gobert is suspended for that play-in tournament. Before we get into your thoughts on that game, just assess to me the Minnesota Timberwolves trade for Rudy Gobert and how it looks now, especially going up against a Lakers team who you gave a lot of picks to that might end up now ending your season. Well, yeah, it's probably going to go down as the worst trade of the decade, at least, (laughs) and one of the worst trades of all time in, in the NBA. It's ridiculous what they gave up. They gave up three really good rotation pieces in addition to Four first-round draft picks and a first-round pick swap here later on, too. All this to pay Rudy Gobert. I think he's making around $40 million per season over the next three years. Apparently, teammates don't like him. You know, we saw it in Utah where in playoff games, they need to take him out of the game in the fourth quarter. Uh, So I don't know what Minnesota was thinking. You know, they seem to be on a a pretty good path, you know, uh, building around Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns. But... Uh, yeah, this is really blowing up in their face, and I don't think it's going to work out for them very well. Yeah, it's more damning that they're saying, you know what, we're good without you. We'll we'll go to this playoff game without you in there. And uh, me personally, I kind of like their chances better without him, right? Like, he hasn't necessarily been the guy that we saw in Utah for several seasons. What are your thoughts on the Minnesota Timberwolves sans Rudy Gobert tonight? Well, I don't think that they're going to win the game. I don't think that they're going to make any noise in the playoffs, really. However, I think they're going to cover the spread here tonight. (laughs) It's an eight-and-a-half-point spread. And this is a team, the Timberwolves now, with nothing to lose. And this is a team that's played up to the competition all season long. This is a spot I've been pounding in the second half as a big underdog. So as a dog of five or more points, they're on a roll right now that's seen them go 14-4 and against the spread in their last 18 in that spot. So this is a team that really does play up to the competition and you dig into the stats from the past 10 games, each meaningful games for each of these teams, the Timberwolves are right there with them. And a number of key stats, the three point shooting has been fantastic here lately. And I'm kind of fading the narrative here too. Everybody knows the situation with the T-Wolves. We all know Gobert's a moron, right? We all know uh, Jaden McDaniels lost a punching contest to a wall 
You know who else knows that? The odds makers know this. That's why the spread is so high. And here's the thing. You touched on it. The Timberwolves might be better without Gobert. They went eight and four straight up without him in the lineup in the 12 games he missed this season. So I think the T-Wolves, I don't think they're going to win, but I think they can avoid being blown out. And I'm happy to take them at plus eight and a half. Well, you said it. You don't think they're going to win, but you think they won't get blown out. Let's talk about the team they're going up against. The Los Angeles Lakers, the second best record in the Western Conference since the All-Star break. And a lot of those games were without LeBron James, you know. So these guys have been playing some very good basketball. You couldn't ask for a better situation to get into playoff basketball if you're a Lakers, if you're a Lakers fan or a member of this Lakers team. Talk to me about the potential prospects of this Lakers team if they can get into this play in, uh, the, the, a playoff tournament. Yeah, I, I I like their chances. I think that they match up very good versus the Grizzlies, if that's who they end up playing. And yeah, you got to give L.A. credit. You know, I, I think that they knew they made a pretty big mistake with the Russell Westbrook trade. They traded a bunch of depth away for Russell Westbrook, and it wasn't working out. They were an extremely shallow team, and if Anthony Davis or LeBron was hurt, they didn't really have too much to throw at yet. Now they're a lot deeper. And they were kind of patient with trading Westbrook. You know, they kind of sat on that for a while and they probably made the best deal that they could have possibly made. And it is really paying off and things are breaking right for them here in this game versus the Timberwolves, I think. So, yeah, I, I do think that this team can go on a run. Am I willing to actually put my own money and bet on that? I don't know. It's tough because what's the big thing with the Lakers that you have to be concerned about? The injuries, right? LeBron's not fully healthy right now. He's got the foot issue. Anthony Davis, his, his bones are pretty much made of chalk. He could go down <laughs> at any moment. You could say that about a lot of guys. You could say that about, uh, you know, the Suns with, with Kevin Durant. They're, they have the best odds in the Western Conference. So I don't know if I want to back them in that situation. But, yeah, the thing is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Lakers fan by any means. I like LeBron. Uh, playoff basketball is better when LeBron's involved. I don't like the Yankees, but playoff baseball is better when the Yankees are involved. So, yeah, I, I kind of like to see the Lakers go on a bit of, run, of a run here. This might be LeBron's last opportunity, too, or one of them, at least. We all know he's old. You know, they talk about that every time he steps on the floor. And uh, he's getting more beat up with each passing season. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be shocked that the Lakers go on a bit of a run here. Yeah, we can't keep taking these LeBron playoff runs for granted anymore because you just never know when it might be the last one. So, like you said, this might be his best shot at it uh, for the remainder of his career. Let's go to the Eastern Conference real quick. The Atlanta yeah. Hawks taking on the Miami Heat. The Heat five-point favorites, the over-under 228 points right now. And just as I went on air – a report dropped from the ringer saying that the Atlanta Hawks have, quote, the green light to trade Trey Young in the offseason this year. Uh, okay. your, your thoughts on a potential, do you think that maybe motivates Trey Young to possibly score an upset against the Miami Heat, a team that has moved as slow as molasses as far as offensive pace is concerned? Uh, do you think that has any sort of bearing on the Hawks' underdog status tonight against the Miami Heat? Well, the timing on that is pretty interesting, Very, isn't it? Right. The day of the game, uh, <laughs> things like that get leaked on purpose. So who knows what's up with that? Uh, so here's the thing. I, I've enjoyed fading each of these teams very much this season. The Miami Heat was the worst bet in the NBA this season, especially as a favorite at home. They were just awful. But the thing you have to consider with Miami is uh, it seems like they're, they're on cruise control a little bit throughout the regular season. Then they raise their game. In the playoffs, when the rotations get a, a little bit tighter, uh, the defense improves. We've seen this with them. They went to the finals in the bubble, and they went uh, to game seven of these finals last year. Um, so uh, I, I don't really care for either team on the spread in this one. I can't trust the Hawks, even as a five-point underdog here. Miami has had their number, and not a whole lot of confidence down the stretch from the, the, the Hawks here. The Sixers rested everybody, and they still beat them outright in a game but speaking of young uh i hope he's not extra motivated because i already locked in my bet i took him to have under 24 and a half points in this game uh, miami they went up against each other in the playoffs last year miami completely shut him down in the playoffs a five game series last year they held him to 15.4 points per game 
in uh, in that series. And that carried over to this regular season. They played four games against each other. Trey Young was held to under 25 points in three of those four games. So Miami's been fantastic against opposing guards lately. Uh, what are they here? Allowing the fourth fewest points to opposing guards over the last 10 games. Great perimeter defense as well. So I think that they can uh, keep Trey from going off here. We'll see uh, if that motivation factors in, I guess, right? Yeah, it feels like every thing in the Atlanta Hawks franchise has changed in the past two years, except Trey Young. He is the central focus, but now who knows how much longer that's going to be a true statement because if he has the green light to go, maybe that might be the best opportunity to shake things up in Atlanta. Well, with the end of the season, a lot of players give these exit interviews. And uh, recently, Dame Lillard went on record saying he doesn't have an appetite to build for guys who are two and three years away. Bradley Beal said he's getting a low patience level. Uh, Luka Doncic uh, was reportedly frustrated the way the season ended. He didn't say anything on the exit interviews. Of these three all-star guards, which, in your opinion, has is is has the most potential to be moved this offseason or ask for a move this offseason between Lillard, Beal, and Luca. I think Lillard might finesse his way into asking for a trade. It's still too early for Luca to do that. Uh, Beal has been involved in rumors for for a long time. I wouldn't be shocked if he does either. But Beal or Lillard's been one of these guys, as we all know, the past couple seasons. He likes to give himself a nice pat on the back for uh, sticking around Portland. Now he's making $40 million or more a season to do that, but he's starting to walk that back a little bit now. Uh, you know, we, we saw some uh, sprinklings of it throughout the regular season, and now he's coming out flat out saying he has no appetite for a rebuild, and why would he? So maybe it is one of these situations where Portland says, all right, like we're going to fully commit to going into a rebuild because, uh, you know, that's not exactly a big uh, free agent destination to go to Portland. And maybe the, they try to extract as much value as they possibly can out of him. Still very much one of the best point guards in the NBA. And I think that they could get a really good return if they do want to go into a rebuild. And he's still, he's probably at the tail end of his prime right now, but if they wait any longer, the return's not going to be that great. So I think we're going to see some stuff behind closed doors and uh, Lillard works his way out of town uh, out of Portland. It's going to be a very interesting off season for a lot of prime all-star guards. Now I want to throw some futures at you for these NBA awards. I think yeah. the rookie of the year and the coach of the year are pretty much locks. Yeah. I think Paolo Bancaro, Mike Brown got that, but the other three, very interesting. Let's go. Number one, the most improved player of the year. I personally went with Jalen Brunson yesterday. You can make uh, arguments for Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Laurie Markkinen, several other players. Who do you have? for the NBA's most improved player this year? I'd probably go with SGA. Uh, I think he's just elevated himself to being a clear-cut top 10 player in the NBA, maybe even a top five scorer in the NBA. So he's now a definitive number one guy. Um, uh, so I would go with him. I, I find the most improved player award, like the criteria for it, I find it to be a bit unusual. Shouldn't it be like a guy you've barely even heard of, like an eighth man off the bench who elevates himself to like starting lineup? Yeah, and like when John Morant won it last year, it kind of messed everything up. I was like, okay, like what are we, how are we doing this now? <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, I don't totally agree with the, the criteria, but for what it is, I'd probably have to go with SGA. Nice, nice. How about the uh, sixth man of the year? It's uh, between Emmanuel Quickly of the Knicks, Malcolm Brogdon of the Celtics, Norman Powell of the Los Angeles Clippers. I personally made the case for Emmanuel Quickly. Who do you have winning the sixth man of the year this year? Yeah, I'd go with Quickly. I think he was a much bigger difference maker than those guys. I think he was a lot more active. Uh, I think he, he had a lot to do with the Knicks' success this year as well. So, yeah, I, I would go with Quickly. I'd agree with you on that one. And last but certainly not least, it's probably one of the tightest MVP races I can remember. You can make all three of them having historically great seasons. Giannis Antetokounmpo, first player in NBA history to average 30, 10, and 5, over 57% shooting. Nikola Jokic, averaging damn near a triple-double. The incumbent, two-time NBA MVP. Joel Embiid, the second center since Bob McAdoo to average 30 and lead the league in scoring two years in a row. 
Yeah. Uh, you can make great cases for all three of these guys, but more than likely one of them's got to walk away with it. Who do you have as the NBA's most valuable player? I'm going to go with Embiid. Uh, like, you, you can make it, if either one of those guys wins it, there's not much of a rebuttal, really. I mean, the top two guys are probably Embiid and Jokic, but I do think that the better player would be Giannis. But other factors come into play here, most notably the fact that uh, Jokic has won it in back-to-back years. So do voters really want to give him uh, a third straight MVP? That's rare territory in the NBA. So I think people are factoring that into the equation. But yeah, you you can't really knock Embiid here. Uh, He he had a great season too. I don't like that he sat out that game versus the Nuggets uh, towards the tail end of the season there in Denver. But yeah, I would give it to Embiid. It's so close, so it's razor thin, isn't it? It's it's the most razor thin MVP race I can remember in a long time. But it gives people like us things to talk about for at least the next several weeks. So that's always fun. Joe Osborne, the host of Chasing Paper. Thank you so much for kicking it with me today on Count It, man. We got to do it again sometime. Yeah, my man. Thank you very much for having me on. Best of luck with your bets and uh, best of luck to all your viewers as well. Appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Guys, don't go anywhere. The man in the chair, Dan Parisi, will be joining me to give us his picks for tonight and tomorrow's NBA play in action. Don't go nowhere. More Countdowns coming up right after this. And welcome back to Count It right here on Points Bet USA. Joining me all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's the man in the chair. The man in the chair, Dan Parisi. <laughs> What's going on, Dan? Guys, I know you were going to say it's the man in the spaceship. All is well here. The trading room is absolutely humming, and we're looking forward to two playing games tonight, Kaz. Oh, man, it's going to be an insane amount of basketball in the next few weeks, and this game has no shortage of storylines, so let's get right into it. The Atlanta Hawks head into Miami for the first play in the game tonight. The Heat are five-point favorites at home. The over-under is 228.5 points. You want to talk about headlines. Just moments ago, a story on the ringer just dropped saying that the Hawks have the green light to trade Trey Young in the offseason. Do you think this sparks something in the Atlanta Hawks? Does it spark something in Trey Young? Or do the Miami Heat got what it takes to continue on to the playoffs tonight, Dan? Talk to me about it. Well, well, it potentially does, Kaz, but I'll tell you what does give the green light, the plus five for the Atlanta Hawks, because Miami, whilst they are above .500 and they do enter with some winning form into this playing game, Atlanta are a really tricky opponent on the defensive end of the the ball. We know that Atlanta can get up and down in a flash. Now, both of these two teams have excelled in certain metrics. Over the past 15 games, both of these two teams are in the top 10 for their offensive rating. Defensively speaking, they both rank in the bottom 10 for opponent field goal percentage. So I think that's going to play into the hands of the Atlanta Hawks, who like to get up and down. Miami, at times, do like to play with a variation of pace. The over-under at 228, it opened at 226. Trey Young, Bogdanovich, Clint Capella, Sadiq Bey, these guys are loaded offensively and they can score. And that's why I do like the Hawks to challenge the Miami Heat at plus five. I'm hoping that there's a slight lean on your end as well for the Hawks here. Yeah, no, nah, I'm with you on that one. I feel like the, everything that's happened throughout the season, Trey Young is still giving you 27 and 10 every single night, and that's what's well, called a down year for him. And the, the Miami Heat play at a snail's pace. If they get, if they have an opportunity to get up and down, I like the Hawks as well on this game. So uh, I'm with you on this one, Dan. Let's hope that we're on the same page as, as, as the Atlanta Hawks tonight when they head into Miami. And secondly, tonight, the Minnesota Timberwolves, After Jaden McDaniels breaks his hand, Rudy Gobert gets into a fight on the bench and is suspended for the game, takes on the Los Angeles Lakers, whose season completely turned around when they made a trade with the Minnesota Timberwolves, acquiring D'Angelo Russell and uh, Jared Vanderbilt and several other players. Now the Lakers, the odds-on favorites, eight-and-a-half-point favorites, the over-under 233 points. How do you see this shaking out, Dan? Well, Kaz, the suspension of Rudy Gobert has meant that the market has seen quite a dramatic flip in some pricing. In the money line, the Lakers have chipped in to 20 cents there. So, And, and on the spread, it's gone out from 5.5 now to 8.5. So no Rudy, no Jaden McDaniels, and there is a GTD tag on Carl Anthony Towns. 
I think this is going to be a really tricky game for the Timberwolves. The, the Lakers, they are presenting as a team that has the second best record in the Western Conference post the All-Star break. Now, granted, there's only been 22 games, but they're 15 and 7, and we can't take that away from them. With a little bit of rest, I think that this Lakers team are going to be able to push this one out to a 9, 10, 11 point game. I think they're going to jump out of the blocks. I like the Lakers to lead this one wire to wire at the end of every quarter. And Anthony Davis, he has returned 76 points over his past two games against the Timberwolves with no Naz Reed coming through that second unit. No Rudy Gobert at the rim pro and a potential miss for Carl Anthony Towns. I think we can book in Anthony Davis for 30 plus and the Lakers to cover the spread for me, Kaz. Dan, uh, you couldn't ask for a better situation if you're the Los Angeles Lakers. They kind of treaded water the entire season, got hot after the All-Star break, and now they're getting some breaks in the play-in tournament. So I'm with you on this one. I think the Minnesota Timberwolves uh, put up a decent fight, maybe. I still have a lot of belief in Anthony Edwards, but that's just way too many players to lose on the road at for a win-in-your-in sort of tournament situation that LeBron and Anthony Davis, I bet, were just clamoring for all season long. If you would have told them back in – December, when there were several games below 500, this is going to be your opportunity to get in the playoffs. I'm sure they take that 10 times out of 10. I have the Lakers Absolutely. as well, covering and winning convincingly against the Minnesota Timberwolves. I won't be here tomorrow, but we got two more playing games uh, tomorrow night. Let's talk about the Chicago Bulls taking on the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors, five-point favorites at home. The over-under, 215 points. The Bulls have been through a lot of changes. They got Pat Beverly back. He treated the play-in tournament like it was the championship last year. Does he have an opportunity to make history repeat itself against the Toronto Raptors? I think he does. I think we might see him in the sixth standing at the scorer's table once <laughs> again, flashing those hands. I actually like the Chicago Bulls to cover the plus five here, Kaz. Both of these sides have been really underwhelming throughout the course of the regular season. And I guess they've given us no confidence to dive into this game. There's been a little bit of action on the trading floor here at the plus five for the Chicago Bulls. I do think that the inclusion of uh, Jacob Puerto uh, on the defensive end probably limits or reduces the impact of Nikola Vucevic. But then there is the explosiveness of Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan, these guys who have been, and been there and done that. The Toronto Raptors... They've just been too inconsistent all season long. They're going to need to find something out of that backcourt. Siakam is an all-star. We know that. So I like the points here to actually go under the 216 and the Chicago Bulls to cover the plus five, Kaz. Yeah, I'm with you on that, on that under, man. Both of these teams have been, like, extremely underwhelming throughout the entire season, especially Fred Van Vliet. He's had times where he looks like his former championship-level self, especially shooting the ball from deep. Those numbers have definitely dropped throughout the season. I mean, Scotty Barnes, there's certain times where he looks like he's about to turn into an all-NBA player, and then he regresses a little bit. I'm just going to lean on the experience of DeMar DeRozan and Zach Levine uh, against this Toronto Raptors team. I actually like them against the Toronto Raptors, even though I know that arena is going to be rocking in uh, Toronto, Canada. They have one of the best home court advantages in the entire NBA. However, I like DeRozan, I like Levine, and I like Pat Beverly. I think he's going to be a difference maker over here. So give me Chicago uh, over the Toronto Raptors on the money line for that one. And last but certainly not least, one of my favorite teams in the NBA, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the young, fun Thunder led by Shea Gilgis Alexander and Josh Giddy, taking on the New Orleans Pelicans, who have righted the ship despite not having Zion Williamson for most of the season, mostly on the back of a resurgent Brandon Ingram in the second half of the season. They are five-and-a-half-point favorites at home. The over-under is 228-and-a-half points. How do you see the shaking out, Dan? Yeah, I'm with you in terms of loving what OKC have been able to do this year. In particular, they're playing without a centre, so it's amazing that they've been able to find themselves in this position. But they're coming up against Jonas Valanciunas, so I think that's going to be a really tricky match matchup for whoever's playing that Flex 5, one of the Williams boys. Uh, I feel really bad saying this, but I've got a couple of bets in this game. Josh Giddy under 18.5, the Australian. I just don't think that he gets the volume on the offensive end in this game because I do think that the trajectory here is for Shea Gilgis-Alexander to go off. 
Whilst he might go off and go over his 32 and a half as the prop, I still fancy the certified bucket getter for New Orleans Pelicans to get the W and cover the 5.5. I think they're far too versatile at both ends of the floor. CJ should steer them offensively and defensively. They can get scrappy with Herb Jones. So I like the Pelicans to cover at home. It's a really tough environment to play in NOLA. I like the Pelicans minus 5.5. Josh Giddy under 18. Point five and Shay Gil- Gilgis Alexander over 32 and a half. I like those picks, but one thing you're not mentioning is Jose Alvarado, Grand Theft Alvarado. He's going to give – Shea Gilgis is going to get his points, but he's going to make him work for every single one of them. And in the playoffs, Back. that matters. So I like the Pelicans in this game. Brandon Ingram has been all universe this entire mm. uh, second half of the season. And like you said, they're playing without, without a center, and that is where they thrive in New Orleans. So, I mean, this is a team, however – in the beginning of the season, was Zion Williamson that had very big plans, especially going into Western Conference. So even without him, they did happen to play very well last year in the playoffs as well. So I like New Orleans to keep it going. Uh, but the points, however, I'm staying clear of that. Just smashing the New Orleans Pelicans on the money line. I think they're going to win this one tonight. Dan Parisi, my man, thank you so much for kicking it with us right here on Count It and giving us this play in action as it kicks off tonight. Thank you, guys. Miami. Guys, thank you so much for kicking it with me right here on Count It. Uh, We are going to wrap this up with a few of my picks right after this. Don't go nowhere. More Count It comes up right after this. Welcome back to Counter right here on Points Bet USA. You know what time it is. Let's get in some NBA play-in picks as the play-in tournament kicks off tonight in Miami, Florida. The Atlanta Hawks. Take on the Miami Heat. The Heat open up as five-point favorites. The over-under, 228.5 points. Let me tell you something. The Miami Heat probably play the most unesthetically pleasing brand of basketball I see in the entire NBA. They play slow. They play methodical. They, they, they make it ugly. They muck it up. They aren't trying to bomb threes on you. They're just trying to grind you down. The same thing they did to the Atlanta Hawks last year in the playoffs uh, and with the Miami Heat taking on the Atlanta Hawks and everything they've gone through this season. I can't say that this isn't a game tailor-made for Trey Young to still have one of those vintage postseason Trey Young performances. I mean, I have absolutely no logical reason to pick against them other than the fact that I don't think the Miami Heat can match offensively with the Atlanta Hawks if the Atlanta Hawks get going between Deontay Murray, Bogdanovich, Trey Young, Capella, those guys. I... I just don't see it happening. I mean, they could slow him down. I know Trey Young remembers that matchup against the Heat very well. I know they feel very confident going up against that team. But I'm taking the Hawks on points here. I think the Heat will win. But those five points, I think it's going to come down to the absolute wire. So give me the Hawks plus five, and I'm taking the under as well. I mean, I feel like the Hawks may be able to score a little more points than they're usually used to against this Miami Heat team. But give me the Hawks plus five on this one. On the nightcap, the the Minnesota Timberwolves take on the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers, eight and a half point favorites to over under 233 points. Guys, the Minnesota Timberwolves couldn't have picked a worse time to absolutely break down. Physically, mentally, I guess spiritually. I love me some Anthony Edwards. Carl Anthony Towns is still a game time decision. The Los Angeles Lakers have been chomping at the bit to get back into this type of situation. I think the Lakers win in a walk. Take the Lakers to cover the spread over here. I'm also taking the over under. No Rudy Gobert. A gimpy Anthony uh Carl Anthony Towns taking on Anthony Davis. I think they're going to go absolutely insane. Don't sleep on D'Angelo Russell as well. I think he is going to have a field day trying to go off against the team who traded him right back to the Los Angeles Lakers. Wednesday night, the Chicago Bulls take on the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors open up as five-point favorites to over under 215 points. 
The Raptors, much like the Heat, have just been so inconsistent all year. However, I just feel like their brand of basketball might be enough to slow down the Chicago Bulls and the offensive firepower of Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, and Nikola Vucevic. However, the Toronto Raptors and that incredible home court advantage that they have, especially in the playoffs, might not hit the same like it did several years ago when Kawhi Leonard was there. But you're not underestimating the fact that DeMar DeRozan is going back into Toronto, a place that he knows very well in a winner-take-all, win-in-advance tournament scenario. I like the Chicago Bulls here on the money line. Give me the Bulls to win, and uh, I'm going to take a very, very slight over on points between the Chicago Bulls and the Toronto Raptors. Last but certainly not least, one of my favorite young teams in the entire NBA, the Oklahoma City Thunder, getting their taste of postseason basketball against the New Orleans Pelicans. Pelicans, five-and-a-half-point favorites, over-under 228-and-a-half points. I love me some Shea Gilgis Alexander and Josh Giddy. Jalen Williams, both of them have been playing very well. However, I think Brandon Ingram has quietly put together one of his best seasons, and they're playing without a center. An opportunity for Jonas Valanciunas to absolutely go off inside, and C.J. McCollum is one of the most playoff-tested, battle-tested players in the entire NBA, especially in the Western Conference. I'm taking the Pelicans to cover here. Give me the slight over on points. It's going to be a whole lot of buckets being scored. And the New Orleans Pelicans moving on in the play-in tournament. Guys, that's it for today's episode of Counter. I want to thank my guests, Joe Osborne, Dan Parisi, kicking it with me as the NBA play-in tournament kicks off tonight. The games count for real, people. My name is Kazim Famiwide, and I will see you guys on Thursday. This has been Count It, and I'll see you next time. Peace out.